Hello everyone and welcome to the first of our Security, Compliance and Identity live Q&As. My name is Gareth Boyle, the Senior Marketing Executive for Microsoft here at Fusion 5 and I'm joined today by our presenters, Senior Consultant Troy Gerber and Information Security Officer Umi Bates. Before we get started, just a quick couple of bits of housekeeping. The first 40 minutes of today's session you'll hear from our presenters on security and compliance and the final 20 minutes will act as our Q&A session. If you do have any questions, you'll see an option to submit them via the top right hand side of your screen. So please feel free to use it at any time during the presentation and we'll address your questions at the end of the session. We'll also be sending you a copy of the recording after the session as well as answers to all of the questions asked. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to our first presenter, Umi. Thanks, Gareth. Let me just get my slide ready. And we are good. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Fusion 5 Security and Compliance webinar. We will start off with introducing the presenters, today's topic, and why security and compliance is important. Following that, I'll give you a high level summary of how Microsoft can help you with your security needs. Troy will then take over to explain how Microsoft comes to the party when it comes to your compliance needs. We'll wrap up with discussing where to go from here before opening the floor to questions. So first off, your presenters. Hailing from South Africa and currently based in Auckland, we have Troy Gerber, Senior Consultant in the Modern Work and Security Space. I've worked with Troy on many a project before and I always love the excitement that he brings to the table when he talks tech. Um, he's one of Fusion 5's best in all things SharePoint, OneDrive, Teams, Power Apps and the like. You want enterprise security and productivity, he's your guy. Across the pond, there's me, Umi Bates, born and bred in Brunei, but now calls Melbourne home. I've been working in the security space for Fusion 5's managed services team, overseeing our information security ISO 27001 certification framework. My interests lie in making sense out of things, what they mean to businesses and translating data into useful action items. So the first part of today's session will be about security. I'll talk about how you can identify real-time threats, how you can assess your security posture and understand your key objectives and priorities when it comes to security. I'll briefly cover how Microsoft solutions can help you sleep at night and finally how you can obtain a recommendation path for mitigating your security concerns. The second part will be about compliance. Troy will talk about how you can identify where dark data lives and understand the risks associated to that data. He'll then give you sneak peek of compliance management solutions that can help you simplify and automate compliance process. But before we do that, let's answer the why question. Why should you care about security and compliance? Consider the ongoing ransomware attack on the Waikato District Health Board. A group of cyber criminals are claiming to have stolen sensitive patient data. If this is true, this means that this incident is a serious privacy breach. On the other side of the Pacific Ocean, cyber criminals practically caused a fuel shortage in the US when they attacked Colonial Pipeline. So no matter what your organization and industry, disruptions to your operations are expensive. You must come up with resources to deal with the incident. You get other parties involved, such as forensic specialists, and you have to report to privacy regulators. Loss of revenue, expenses related to response and mitigation, loss of staff productivity, fines and penalties, these aren't pocket change. Not to mention your reputation is going to be affected as well because customers and vendors would think twice about working with companies who have lax protocols around security. But most importantly, having a strong security and compliance program helps you manage your information assets and those of your customers. So now let's talk about security. Here are the common business problems I encounter that may sound very familiar to you. How do I ensure my people can work from home without having disruption to their access? How do I make sure I don't lose my company's confidential data? How do I know that devices my people are using to access company data is secure? How do I prevent my users from falling for phishing scams and become victims to ransomware? How do I make sure that I comply with legal and regulatory requirements? What about using too many standalone security solutions that's hard to manage. How about spending money on security, but you know, finding it difficult to justify your ROI? Um, response times to dealing with threats aren't fast enough, either we miss them completely or we're late to the game. So these pro business problems 
they are very common across all types of organizations, but each organization is unique. There are four types of customers on different points on their security journey. So customer A is just starting out. They don't know what they have, so visibility is what they need. Customer B has that visibility, but doesn't know where to start, so they need help with strategy. Customer C has both visibility and strategy, but they don't have the know-how, so they need capabilities. And the last customer has all three, but they want to do things better, do more with less, so they seek optimization. The good news is no matter where you are in your security journey, either A, B, C, or D, we here at Fusion 5 can help you. So I hear you ask, how do you do that? How, how do you do that, Umi? So we do that by completing the Microsoft Security Workshop with you. This is a three-day engagement over the course of two to three weeks with the objective of giving you visibility, capability, and strategy. There are three parts of the workshop, threat discovery, solutions, capabilities, and security strategy. There is a special license that is activated in your tenancy when you sign up for the workshop. This license called Threat Check leverages selected features and functionalities of different Microsoft solutions to gain visibility of the threats in a Microsoft 365 cloud environment. The good thing is it has no impact on your user. It simply collects data about how your current situation looks like. There are other add-on and optional modules should you wish to expand the threat discovery scope, which I'll cover briefly in the next slide. Once the threat discovery part is completed, you'll then be shown the capabilities of Microsoft security solutions. You'll then be able to see how you can detect threats, you can prioritize them and respond to them, and you can see where your existing security gaps are and what you can do to close these. The third piece is about assessing your security posture, understanding your key objectives and priorities. So we know that different organizations have different needs and they view risk differently. So no security strategy is the same. To produce a custom security strategy specific to your organization, we explore your current security landscape, your greatest concerns, your top three desired improvement areas. We'll also look at what's going on in your world the initiatives that you have around your strategy, your operations, your infrastructure. We can, we'll also look at what can help or hinder your security outcomes, what your current maturity level is and where you want to go. All this is then consolidated into your security strategy document. So at the end of the workshop, you'll have visibility to threats in your environment. You'll have an understanding of what the security, security solutions can do, and you'll also have a documented security strategy and a recommendation path on how you can improve your security posture. In other words, the security, post, the security workshop is a rent before you buy exercise. You're going to see just how much easier managing your organizational security is with Microsoft's tools, and you'll also be able to build a business case for it so you can have these tools at your disposal. The security workshop will cover these tools in depth, so I will only give you a general idea of what they are capable of. So we start with a threat check tool. So this is one provision specifically for the workshop and is to as decommissioned at the completion of the workshop. So as mentioned before, it brings together selected capabilities from different Microsoft solutions. You may have heard of these before. So these are Microsoft 365 Defender, Azure Active Directory Identity Protection, Microsoft Defender for Office 365, and Microsoft Cloud App Security. So what this tool can do is that it can detect correlation between threats. For example, a user logging in from a new device and accessing files they don't usually work with raises a red flag that this account may be compromised. It can detect malware and phishing URLs in emails. It can detect malicious files in SharePoint Online, OneDrive, and Microsoft Teams. It can also flag shadow IT, which are apps that users install on the devices that are not sanctioned and controlled by the IT department. For instance, it can detect Dropbox or Google Drive and look at the traffic and frequency going on in these apps. The second tool, Azure Sentinel, is an add-on module to the engagement. It's essentially a tool that can detect threats, reduce false positives so you can focus on real alerts. It gives you context around threats. It can also make recommendations um, on responses on how to deal with the incidents and it can proactively hunt for threats. So this tool makes it easy for you to manage your security incidents and automate your responses for security alerts. 
The third tool, Endpoint um, Protection Module, this focuses on your Windows 10 devices. It gives you continuous real-time discovery of the weaknesses and list threats by priority. It can also prevent users from accessing malicious websites and blocks malicious activities from untrusted apps. The final piece, the optional hybrid identity protection module is very useful if you have an on-premise active directory. What it can do is that it can pick up vulnerabilities such as storing user credentials in clear text and flag inactive accounts so you can remove their access rights to prevent stealthy breaches. It can detect when users are copying files from domain controllers, data exfiltration. It can also keep track of users' behavior and see if they're behaving normally. By normal, we mean compared to the historical activity and those of their peers. And if they're acting suspiciously, this, anom this anomaly then gets reported so it can be investigated. So there you have it. A high level overview of the Rent Before You Buy program where you can test drive Microsoft security solutions. Whatever your business problems are and wherever you are on your security journey, Fusion 5 can help you gain visibility, work on your security strategy, show you what these solutions are capable of and how it can help you optimize your security. So now over to Troy, who will talk about compliance. Thank you, Amy. Let's do the uh, slide sharing thing. Good afternoon, everybody. I understand that there is a uh, announcement in uh, Melbourne at the moment, so hopefully we have a few people who actually have decided to stay on the stay on the call. Um, let me quick make sure I get into the right place. So today we're going to talk about uh, compliance. Umi, thank you very much for the great, awesome intro. Um, we went through all the different uh, scenarios we are looking at when it comes to ensuring that information that we have is secure and, and the different practices we can go through. One of the things worth uh, having a very secure world, and, and I like to use analogies, so thinking about securing a house with um, security practices, is that once we have information inside our organization that is uh, protected from people on the outside, what do you do with the information that's on the inside? And this is where data compliance comes in. Um, I'll leave you to read the information on the screen, but effectively data compliance looks at look at rules inside the organization and rules externally to the organization that influence how we work with data and uh, how we treat data uh, and ensure that it is compliant and um, following, the, following the rules of the law, I guess. So why does it matter? Uh, there's two things that have been happening recently or over the last couple of years is, and that is a kind of massive challenge for a lot of organizations is, one of them is the exponential growth of data. Um, the amount of data that has been uh, generated by team members and, and organizations is, is growing on a regular basis. Um, work from home has actually added to this, the fact that we have people working remotely, uh, creating content that is local. If you didn't have a work from home strategy, uh, that is we sort of local devices, then upload it to some sort of cloud storage, uh, hopefully at a later stage or share. Uh, so we have a lot of data that has just been generated on a, on a regular basis by normal people doing the day-to-day -day work. And the regulatory bodies are constantly coming up with new regulations um, that we need to apply, comply with. Uh, recently in New Zealand, we've had the Privacy Act kick in. Um, and if you aren't compliant with that and actually doing the right effort, it does, it does have a, a negative impact um, in a little later stage if you are found not to be compliant. So why compliance matters is it helps us identify and avoid possible red flags in the business. Um, by being compliant, we can actually pick up issues um, that are regulatory based and actually act on them and do something about that. Um, we mentioned earlier, uh, failure to comply with serious, this, with, with some of the regulations, security aspects can lead to quite heavily heavy fines. If you look at uh, companies that are working with uh, people in Europe that are GDPR compliant. Uh, if you are proven to have breached GDPR, um, it is quite a hefty fine. Um, even in New Zealand, if you breach the Privacy Act and it can be proven that you haven't made enough effort to actually secure private data, it could lead to a uh, quite a hefty fine as well. And then last but not least, and the DHB example stands, uh, stands out quite well, is reputational damage. Um, if you are not shown to be compliant and actually taking um, a serious effort to protect data that is inside your organization, uh, you're seen as an, as an unsafe vendor or, or a bad act in the world. We also know that at the moment about 80% of the information stored in most organizations actually above 80% is unstructured or dark data. Um, and we'll talk a bit about what dark data is and how we can identify it in a, in a slide or two. 
Um, we know that about over 53% of organizations in the last year have experienced some sort of insider attack. And let's, let's pause there for a moment and, and unpack what we mean by insider attack, because that's something we're going to talk about in a moment as well. An insider attack is when data or information is compromised internally, either maliciously or uh, by accident. And strange enough, the by accident is actually the more the one that's more prolific. Um, we find people accidentally sharing information because they don't realize that it's a coup information, uh, or they don't realize that they should be sharing it externally because nobody's told them that the data is secure. So the prevalence of accidental data breaches uh, from insider attacks is actually higher than malicious attacks, but we need to protect against both of them. And as mentioned earlier, we're seeing about 200 plus on average regulatory updates per day from over a thousand bodies worldwide. Um, and even though we're a, a couple of tiny islands that people pretend we don't exist every now and then, uh, we're in a global audience, we're a global market, we're a global player. We need to ensure that we are compliant with all the regulations in all the countries we work with. So let's have a quick look at when we talk about data, what, what our sort of our typical data scenarios are. Um, there, there is a middle one which I haven't put on the slides and we'll talk a little bit about that later and that's semi-structured data. But typically most organizations have structured data and unstructured data. Um, this has been around for Yonks and we've, after the last decade or two, we've, we've, we've tried as hard as possible in the document space to, to regulate these. Structured data is stuff that you everybody uses every day. And if you run a company, you work for a company, you're, you're working with structured data even if you don't realize that. Uh, it's typically a relational database based, so it's sitting in a very uh, SQL, Oracle, or the database behind a line of business system. Um, the information is, is very prescriptive, IOD numbers, bank account numbers, error code, things are easily identified um, and I'll, I'll always have to be captured in a structured way. Um, sometimes a human base where we're capturing through a form that takes us through an error handling process to make sure the data is relevant. Um, if we go to a bank, for instance, and you fill in uh, an online form and you don't have the correct format for your credit card number or your IOD number, it would kick out and say there's an error. And most times this is machine generated. One of the key tenants around structured data is that it is typically searchable. Um, so if you think about most of the lines of business systems you use on a daily basis in your organization, it's normally quite easy to find and identify the information you need. And examples of these type of applications that we have internally would be something like your CRM system, your finance operations system, and for organizations that do have one in place, your enterprise documentary records management system. Um, so in a nutshell, information that goes in, in a very structured way, we know where it is, we know what the format is, we know how to find it, and it's something we can use quite easily. So somebody said to you, tell me about custom X, you'd go to CRM open, type in custom X, and you have all the information you need. Very structured. Unstructured data falls into a whole bunch of different categories. And I'm going to step through some of these in a bit more detail, um, so we just get an idea of what we mean by that and some of the, the things to look out for. So I'll, I'll leave it on screen for you to have a look through. But let's start off with some of the ones that you might, might, might not be too obvious. Uh, media files, audio, video, and images. Um, this, call, this session we're having now is done using Microsoft Teams Live. Um, you could be doing a Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting, um, irrelevant which one. And at the end of the meeting, you can take your recording and upload it to wherever you want to for to sharing out. So if you in the Microsoft world, uh, we can upload that to Microsoft Stream, and Stream will even go one step further and create a transcript. So I'll actually go and listen to the listen to the video and give me the text. This information now sits somewhere. Uh, OneDrive, you might have uploaded into a customer's uh, Dropbox. We don't know. Um, same with the transcript. The state is unstructured. It's not in a relational space. There's no format in which we had to work with it, but it's still information that we want to protect. Um, that information in that transcript might contain sensitive information because the transcript happens to be of a board meeting. Images um, also contain data, not only metadata in the background, but many times we take screenshots. You might be taking one of this right now, or we have a snapshot of a report or a financial statement or a, a marketing program we're running. And that's uploaded into our content management systems via SharePoint, OneDrive, whatever. Um, and typically we don't really think about an image as being something we can is harmful, um, but that content of that image can be used as, by a bad actor as well. 
and you want to make sure that the information is not sent out to uh, somebody who doesn't need to see it. And we'll talk through some of the ways that we can actually do things like extract that information from, from those in a bit as well. Then we have our normal stuff, uh, text files, PowerPoint presentations, things we just generate on a regular basis. Um, if you're like me, I tend to start most things I do that I need to be um, in, a, in a format by opening up Word, uh, PowerPoint, Excel. I start with a draft version, save it to my OneDrive. In my case, that's my practice, and there it is. It's in draft version. Even though it hasn't been published and it's not part of a record process, it's still information that potentially has value for the organization or is at risk value. How do I identify that? And and we all have this on our on our we, we generate on a regular basis. Email is a is a, a big player when it comes to unstructured data. Emails in the middle. It's it's semi structured in the sense that there are some structured information like a to from subject etc. I typically body of the email and the content we attach to that is from an unstructured source. And email is one of the biggest tools when it comes to internal insider attacks because sending something out and um, I, I, I would sort of bet that most people in the school at some stage have typed in send to John and this chosen the wrong John and you sent the other John the information they shouldn't be receiving. How do you how do you protect against that? Social media data, stuff we post onto social media, uh, even though the social media platforms are external to our business, the information is still yours. Um, I, you, you don't get to have an excuse of saying I was hacked nowadays, and that's why uh, I said bad things about a person. Uh, we assume that you've taken the necessary steps to make sure the data is relevant and that not everybody can access your social media platform or tweet on your behalf. Um, the last two are a bit more relevant to them on the on the comm side. I'll skip the mobile data because that's not really a, a, a typical example, but it, it's quite a good example in the sense of uh, companies that have remote workers. But communications is a huge thing. So right now we're, we're chatting. You could be typing things in the Q&A box. If you use any of the, the collaboration tools like Teams, uh, Zoom, etc., uh, we're able to chat. We're able to have a uh, direct conversation with each other. We're able to chat in, in groups. All this information and data is unstructured. Uh, it lives somewhere and we don't know what to do with it. I could be saying uh, bad things to me, not that I have a word because she's amazing. Uh, or I could be talking to a colleague and uh, divulge financial information, which I don't think is a problem. And that information becomes available because they forward it um, or it, highlight, it doesn't highlight as something as secure. So these are some of the main sources of unstructured data in long session. Um, and we're just talking about structured data. The, the, the term dark data is 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 a quite a relevant use. Um, in different industries are different types of dark data, but this is really where we focus on. So what are the risks of this dark data? Um, I'll I'll step through some of these in a in a bit more detail as well. But let's let's start off with the the, the non-compliant ones. Um, Dark data is inaccurate because I don't know it's there. So I could be generating content or creating information that has been updated, has been outdated. And we, we all do this. We save a template, uh, we save a copy of a presentation, and next time we want to use it, it's out, there's a new version out there or it has incorrect information. Now I had a client who has a template and puts their uh, financial results which they use for their board packs. So if you use the wrong board pack, you have the wrong information uh, being available. Um, there's a bit of a, a, a hard and soft side when it comes to storage uh, with data that's uh, dark data that's unstructured. What tends to happen is we, because you don't know about it, we don't do anything with it. So when somebody says, hey, let's archive or let's migrate content, we don't say no, don't do it because we don't know what's there. So we say absolutely, but take everything with you. And uh, I do quite a lot of migration work at the moment and I'm seeing on a regular basis where clients don't know that what, what's in their data, so they just take everything with. Um, and that basically gives us the overhead of having to deal with storage and additional cost to actually maintain that data. Um, it also gives rates an operational issue when it comes to backup and restore and recovery time. And the fact that you have so much to backup and restore, you aren't actually storing the data your business needs to actually run. We also have regulatory issues, so if you're on scanning your data and on to making sure that your data is uh, protected and being compliant with laws and regulations uh, in the countries you're in or working in, uh, it becomes an issue. Uh, once again, referring back to the breach scenarios where um, it could have a financial reputational impact. Um, and last but not least, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a bit more detail on the next slide, is unused information is untapped potential. One of the 
biggest challenges of organizations is taking tacit knowledge, that information that sits inside the head of every employee that's worked for you and actually having it available for your organization to use and not to never to access that tacit information or that, that company knowledge um, has an actual physical cost um, and uh, dollar I loss. So before we jump into the tooling side, uh, what are the benefits of knowing your dark data? Apart from the regulatory, regulatory aspects, which we, we touched on earlier, there is value in, instruct, in structured data. If you can find that information extracted, you can use it. Um, the intelligence containing things like proposals, slides, PowerPoint presentations that are stored randomly that we don't know are there are potential things that can be used inside the organization. Um, and as the third point makes out, when the structured data is accessible, searchable, available and relevant, it's converting information your enterprise can use. And this has a uh, obviously has an upside when it comes to finding information you can actually use so quicker to market. That actually has a financial impact and has a productivity impact as well. Um, and a uh, different conversation, but sometimes has a psychological impact on, on, on people's ability to work more effectively as well. And the last but not least when it comes to the benefits is there are a lot of tools at the moment that are AI machine learning based that are actually able to transform that data from unstructured data into data you can actually use. And um, I'm going to use that as a bit of a segue into the where we're going to next when it comes to the Microsoft world, because this is where Microsoft really has come to the party really strongly providing those tools to actually unearth your dark data, unstructured data and make it relevant and provide just mechanisms to secure to make it compliant. Okay, enough about the theory. How do we actually make this work? How do we how do we start protecting our, our unstructured data? Uh, the first thing is scan everything, and th this is the, the big thing. With un most unstructured data, um, just exists, so we drop it into places and it's there. Um, we've seen this with remote workers. Um, it's been a huge thing. Um, uh, we have a lot of different documents coming in, uh, different formats, PDF, uh, PowerPoint, Word, irrelevant, a whole bunch coming in. Um, and if you don't know it's there, you can't um, make sure it's compliant um, and you can't automate things like tagging. You can't automate any governance on it. So scanning everything is key. I'm going to focus specifically on our Microsoft world for a bit. And from that side, we want to make sure that we extend information governments to and data protection to every single thing we have in Office 365. So we're scanning our share drives on our on our network file shares or in our Azure file shares, scanning SharePoint. Um, if we're scanning SharePoint, we're scanning Teams automatically and scanning everything in Microsoft 365. Microsoft 365 has a, a plethora of different tools that are that are available and we need to make sure that we know all the data that lives inside of it. So that's the one thing is start with that scanning part and making sure you're actually looking at all the data. Um, once we have a view of what's there, so we we're in the room um, and I, I think of it as a massive room full of Lego. Once you know all the Lego blocks are, we can start sorting them into different little colors and, and uh, cool things. So this is where automation comes in. We need to automate as much as we can. One of the biggest challenges we've had in knowledge management systems and classification systems over decades is getting people to classify. People don't like classifying which is why line of business systems are great because we force you and if you don't do it, something bad is going to happen. But uploading a document somewhere, we don't like to go and add drops and tags, so classification works. When you have classification insights, you're able to do things like automatically migrate content to where it should live, um, do things like legal holds if you do have a regulatory requirement or an audit process, and most of us are or up to audit either internally or externally at some stage. You can do things like production of data before it goes out, uh, putting in place disposition policies to make sure your data has a life cycle. And all this is based off classification insights. Um, we'll talk a bit, a bit in, a, in a slide or two about how we can actually do that classification. What I want to touch on first um, before we get into the compliance side is some of the tools that actually exist already in Microsoft 365 that can actually help you with that. Um, these are both of these are, are reasonably new, um, but they're very much like the uh, COVID-19 vaccine based off technology that's been around for a very long time, um, and that is why they work really well. Um, so one of them is SharePoint Syntax. Syntax uses AI machine learning to scan all your content inside of SharePoint, and you can actually train it to recognize content and do content processing and auto tagging. So what Syntax does is it's not um, forms recognition or OCR. You can actually 
give it keywords and trainers. It says if you detect this word in this space or in this grouping, then assume that this document is of that type and then classify it as a content type of a, um, let's say, a proposal um, and find this information that has client name and add that to a piece of metadata called customer and take the invoice number and add that to this. And then based on those classifications, my compliance tool in the background can then make a decision for me and say, well, this is a document that's been classified as a finance content type. Finance content types I need to, look from a regulatory point of view, keep for seven years or five years, depending on which country you're in, and I need to secure it, and you can't email it out to anybody that has a Gmail address. I can start applying those rules to it. So syntax is something I would definitely would like. We would recommend having a look at. There is, a, we can talk. There's a there's a license cost for it, but the value way outweighs the the, the cost of actually uh, the, what the license does. Something new that's come out recently. This is actually based off syntax. When syntax uh, started last year, this is called Microsoft Viva Topics. Um, interesting name choice. Viva Topics does discovery of keywords and content inside your organization. Once again, it's a it's a additional licensed product on top of um, your SharePoint content uh, and OneDrive. What it does is it goes and it catalogs every single piece of content you have. Um, security obviously is key, so you, you don't get to see what you what you don't have rights to. And what it does is it comes back with keywords. So it actually starts finding keywords in your content and says, hey, there are some keywords that I, that I found. These are the people related to them. And this is the content related to these keywords. Um, and that pre presents you with this and says, what do you want to do next? Do you want to create a information page about it? So in Fusion 5, we have uh, Viva Topics running. We've been running now for close to uh, about two months. When we started off, we had only our corporate metadata uh, classification, which had a, a probably in about sort of 80 different terms that we use on a regular basis. Uh, with the Viva Topics running, we've discovered over 3,800 keywords in the organization that we're now able to curate and actually use as part of our data, our data identification process. So why are these two important? Um, because they give you insights and also discover information in the content that you that is unstructured and actually tells you that I found these keywords and I can actually auto classify, which helps with your, your compliance need. There are a couple of additional examples. One of them, which is uh, I don't have on screen, but is worth more noting, is if you are doing image processing, you can actually drop an image into SharePoint document library. SharePoint will then automatically try and extract the text using OCR from that image, and it'll put it into a column called extract the data. Uh, why is this important? I mentioned earlier, images are weird. I mean, how do you, how do you know if the image um, needs to be protected if it contains data that is, that is needs to be compliant? With the, with, the, with the extraction of the text put into a specific column, you can have workflow that looks at the text and says, hey, there are words in here that tend to mean that this is secure information or information I don't want to share out. And then you can apply your compliance rules and lock that down for things like sharing or disposition or retention policies against that. Cool, let's quickly switch over to the last three slides and let's see what Microsoft brings to the party when it comes to the compliance side. There is a massive catalog of compliance tools that are available. I'm going to touch on the sort of the key ones. We aren't going to go down to technical detail, we're just having a look at what they are. One of my favorite parts of the compliance capability is there's a compliance dashboard. So there's a thing called the Microsoft Compliance Score. What the compliance score does is it looks at regulatory requirements. If you look at the ones in the just below the, the light blue, it looks at all the regulatory compliance globally. And this is a global thing. It's not just a New Zealand Australia thing and says, right, let me look at your data you have and see if you comply with these. Um, it looks through the inf information that it's scanned. Um, and we'll talk about the sources in a moment as well. Um, gives you a score, and but not only tells you what your potential score is, it then highlights the risk areas, and then has drill throughs on what to do to negate those risks and actually bring your score up. Um, so it's not just that, hey, something's gone wrong, it's something's gone wrong, this is why, and this is what I think you should do to make that change. Um, so the compliance dashboard is a, is a phenomenal start and a great tool uh, to get an idea of where your risk is right now. Um, the data in compliance, the compliance tool is pulled off the other Microsoft uh, security tools and assets. 
um, and it uses algorithms that are based off global algorithms. So as things change and new compliance regulations kicked in, this is automatically updated in the background. You don't have to do it yourself, which is really, really, really powerful. Once we have this compliance in place, one of the things we want to do is we want to make sure we can protect our data. So information protection and governance is, is key. And there's sort of four areas that we Microsoft provide tooling for information protection, information governance, data loss prevention and records management. Um, these terms might be familiar to some. For those that aren't, I'll quickly shoot through them um, and we'll, we'll talk about how they're working. So information protection looks at identifying information and then providing protection on that. Um, let's take a good example. I, I have a customer I worked with recently in the education sector that has a very specific number format uh, for tagging information related to um, the vendor types that work with. Um, this information is stored across the different systems inside of their organization, mostly in Microsoft 365. Um, and what we were able to do that from an information protection point of view um, is tell the information protection tool to look for that specific format in documents. And once it, if it found it in a document, to then add a watermark to the back end saying that this is company confidential and also enable encryption. So we actually can encrypt the document um, so there's an encrypted document, not just a unstructured document laying in the background. Um, the same information protection because we're able to auto tag and auto label um, then allows our information governance to kick in. So this information protection has discovered uh, the document. We can then go and say, right, we've got it from based off the discovery. We can now identify this and I'll use uh, finance as a, as a constant example, a finance document. And we are going to add this retention period and this disposition policy to it. Um, and we are also going to lock that down. Um, the information protection allows you to, you to identify something called sensitive types where you can actually say this type of information is sensitive. And there are a whole bunch that are just ship out the box that Microsoft had taken care of, like credit card numbers, uh, social security numbers, um, New Zealand identities, um, Australian identities. These sensitive types, um, they also become part of the governance. So if a document has sensitive information, I can add extra layers of protection to make sure that information is sent out. Where data loss prevention kicks in is it looks at the, uh, the governance as well as the sensitive types of protection parameters and says, right, if it's a finance document, I am going to have a rule that says you can't email a finance document to anybody outside the organization unless you're Bob in finance or unless you the the, the finance uh, finance director so we can start providing adding these rules that prevent data from leaving our organization or being sent to the wrong people either maliciously or by accident um, a practical example of this in our organization um, we one of our processes we used to have we don't anymore um, speak slightly out of the bedroom uh, was a travel request. It used to be quite a, a manual process when I arrived and one of the really weird things we had inside our travel request form was your passport number, uh, which is really private information um, and here we were shipping this as a Word document through email um, that could very easily be sent to a wrong, an external, uh, external party or somebody who could use that maliciously and, and compromise your, your security. Um, our information policy now is identifies passport numbers, ID, ID numbers, uh, bank account numbers for New Zealand. And if you try and send anything around the company that has it in an in the email or document, you get an alert and it'll I'll tell you you're sending it out. Are you sure? Or in some cases, it'll actually just completely block that communication. And then last but not, last, last but not least, the information government is resource management is once we are able to identify content um, that is unstructured, add governance to it, we can then take it through a records management process um, and the records management is twofold. One, to make sure we handle content lifecycle fund structured information, but also to ensure that that uh, we comply with any government regulations. I've, I've used finance documents as, as an example quite regularly, but typically most government, government governments will specify that finance information needs to be kept for a certain period of time. Um, to prove that you, what you've done with it and typically they will define how you dispose of it as well. And this is where the records management kicks in. Moving on to one of my, my favorite areas and this is uh, insider risk management. And this is something that's recently been added to the suite, um, recent the last couple of months. And insider risk management is a compliance solution that helps minimize internal risks uh, by enabling you to detect, investigate and uh, act on malicious or inadvertent activities in the organization. Um, 
and it's 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 a combination of things. So the one that one one of the insider governance, um, insider risk management tools is around communication compliance. So this allows me to do things like monitor, uh, check conversations, and, and not not in a big brother way, but in a in a sort of a more uh, a, a caring parent way, and ensure that if I if I detect people are doing using terminology that might be um, bad. I can't think of a better word for bad uh, or something we, we, we don't really want to have in our organization. It could be profanity. It could be anything. It also could be uh, talking about a secret product that we don't want any of the market to know about or the uh, and if, if, we, if we can detect this communication, uh, we can actually go and say, hey, if, is, is this a potential risk? Somebody's talking about something they shouldn't be doing or shouldn't have or in, in a negative way uh, or and we can then act on it. Uh, so typically you go through a situation where you'd create the policy um, and then uh, you get alerts on it. You can triage it, investigate and then take action. So it's not something that you just go, you're a bad person, stop saying horrible things. We'll actually look through it. Um, the other side for insider risk management is being able to set up risk profiles. And I, I alluded to an example where I can potentially not have information shared with external actors that I don't want to. So let's, let's create an example where I'm creating a project. It's a top secret new product that's going to save the world and make everything greater. I don't want anybody else to know about it. I can then use an information risk management policy to say, any documentation or content stored in this space inside of Microsoft 365, do not allow anybody to send this out to anybody with a competitor email address that's not in the organization. So it's it's DLP, but not in the same way. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule. It actually allows us to be a little more flexible and it follows the same process of letting creating the policy, being alerted when something is highlighted and then actually going through the triage investigate and action process. So it's not as cut and dry as data loss prevention, but allows you to actually manage insider risk and then refine your policies going down the line. And then last but not least, um, if we do have a situation where we need to find information, we have a very powerful tool in the um, e-discovery uh, capabilities inside of Microsoft 365, which allows us to do discovery across multiple data sources inside of M365 and externally as well. Um, ensure that uh, we can generate reports and audit logs, um, as well as doing data redaction, which is a really cool capability of actually finding information, redacting it so that we can export these reports out um, from a legal perspective and if we're ever investigated. Um, the data loss prevent this e discovery is uh, one of the more powerful tools. It does require additional license. That's something we can happy to discuss with you how that works and and where it kicks in. So that covers the compliance side of it. Uh, quite a lot, as I mentioned, the catalog is quite huge, um, and we're happy to have a discussion around that. Um, and this fits into what we mentioned earlier around some of the workshops that Microsoft are offering when it comes to uh, security and compliance for, for enterprises. So I'm going to keep on uh, chatting a bit on the next step. So where, where do we go from here? Um, we've given you a bit of an insight into some of the, the issues, some of the areas that are, need to be looked at. Uh, what if you have Microsoft 365 or you're in that space where you want to get there? How, how can we, we actually come to the party? So what Microsoft provide um, to their customers through the partner network is security compliance identity workshops. Um, these workshops basically are there for us to come in, uh, sit at the organization, um, and do a full landscape review. Um, there's a security workshop which focuses very much on the, the content that uh, we mentioned earlier, where we look at keeping people outside of your house, identity workshops, making sure that you can identify the, 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 the people coming in or the, or, the, or the right people. So how do we deal with that? Compliance workshop is it talks about the stuff we had today, being able to identify information, add the correct policies, do things like auto labeling, auto classification, keyword searches. And then uh, the endpoint management workshop, which really is about making sure that uh, right down to the, 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 the device that the person has on their hand while they're sitting at home, working from home is secure and the data is uh, secure as well. These are three, these are four individual workshops which can run independently. Um, all could be run as, a, as, a, as one large collective engagement as well. Um, and uh, Gareth will talk a little about how you can connect with us, but the idea is if, you, if you're if interested in these, connect with us um, and we can see how we can facilitate it with you um, and potentially even um, 
unleash or try to get some extra funding to actually go along with that. Um, Umi, would you talk us through the Office 365 health check? Sure can. I've done quite a lot of these in the last six months, <laughs> so I'm the perfect person to talk about it. Um, we do have a special offer at the moment. Um, if you move your Microsoft licensing to Fusion 5 in the next 30 days, you'll get to spend some quality time with me. Well, I run a free Office 365 health check on your tenancy. Um, Gareth will send you more information on this offer after this call, but in a nutshell, what it is, it's a comprehensive review of your Office 365 environment. I look at several key areas such as licensing, entitlements, usage on your secure score. And then after the health check, we can look at optimizing your licenses, um, see if we can bundle them to save cost or look at upgrading them so you can get the functionalities that you need. Um, so yes, we have come to the end of the presentation. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. Thanks for that, Omi. So I've got one question for you from uh, one here. So my organization has a lot of license types. I'm not sure which type, uh, what each type includes. Is that something you guys can look at? Oh, definitely. Um, one of the things that I do as part of the Office 365 health check is have a look at what kind of licenses that you have. And um, sometimes you can see from the data as well that you know, there's there's numbers of licenses that you've purchased, but then you can also see how many it's been assigned and how many people are actually using it. And that way you can then pinpoint which licenses are actually being used and which licenses that you're basically paying for, you know, that, that you're not using at all. So that is definitely something that we can look into optimizing your licenses as part of the Office 365 health check. Thank you. And I've got uh, a couple for Troy here. So first one, what licenses are required to access these tools? Security and compliance. My organization has E3365 licenses. So E3365 is going to give you quite a lot of the tools actually because one of them, because one of the more premium business license, more premium enterprise licenses. Um, there are a lot of the, the different tools. Majority of them are going to be available to you on the E3 license. Where it comes to some of the advanced tools like eDiscovery, Syntax, uh, Viva, there's typically an additional license cost. Um, as part of the license review we do when it comes to optimizations, we look at your security posture, um, run the workshops, and then from the off the back of that, we can actually recommend the license type you might need. Um, we don't typically go with a blanket to get the, the top one and get everything because you might have additional security uh, tools in place. Uh, you might have practices that don't need some of the features. Um, so it's typically part of our license review. E3 will give you a lot of the out-of-the-box compliant uh, DLP categorization uh, where it's where it typically becomes a additional license cost uh, would be some of the automation, um, some of the auto classification, and then um, on the other side, some of the more the more endpoint and uh, data prevention stuff is is not included. Um, that tends tends to more be more on the Azure security side. Thanks, Troy. Actually, do you want to just go to the next slide there as well while you've um, while you're presenting, Troy? Sure, right. And uh, if that that QR code, just as an FYI, if you you want to get in touch, you can scan that on your screen and um, and reach out to any one of our presenters today. I've got another question from Troy for Troy. Is this a once only setup, or do I need to constantly update the tools? So what will happen is once you've done your 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 base setup. Um, Anything from a from a compliance point of view, regulatory point of regulatory point of view is going to be updated in the background by Microsoft. What will not be something as automated is you, you still need to look at the reports, you need to look at your breaches, um, especially when it comes to things like um, classification and data loss prevention. When if you just switch data loss prevention on, nothing will leave your organization because you'll have rules that say don't send out. Um, so typically you'd run the data loss prevention on a, in a um, silent mode, just detecting the type of data that's leaving and then build your plan, um, review your logs, uh, review your reports and then update. Um, and also as your organization changes, the type of data changes. So especially with the insider risk, um, and I'll, I'll use my, my silly example again, but if you are creating that product that's going to save the world um, and it works, and then you decide to create a product that's going to solve um, global hunger, um, you need to go set up an insider profile uh, review again. So um, this is typically falls into the realm of your, your chief information security officer. 
um, or something like like uh, and, and UMI as well, um, that you would have and be able to discuss the security requirements with, um, and they could do some of that configuration for you. But like everything, um, there there is monitoring required. You need to look at where things are going wrong, um, action them, and then also um, this is not really a technical setup point of view. But if you're going to implement tools that are alerting you and notifying you, you can ensure you actually have the processes in the background to support that and the people that are, are going to be grabbing those reports and actually making it actionable, um, be it data stewards or privacy officers. Um, one of the organizations I work with back um, in New Zealand at the moment, we have about 15 privacy officers, depending on where the breach happens, it goes to a specific officer who is then tasked to handle the breach and report on it and, and provide Information back to Steerco. So, so that is non technical, but it's part of a, a, a general security posture overall. Thanks, Troy. One more from JC here. So, can I get automated reports and alerts of compliance issues? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, there are, there, there are, the alerts are, are, are there. We just need to know who to alert and under what conditions. And reports can either be generated on demand or can be automated as well. Um, so, yeah, so absolutely. Thank you. And one more from Michael here. Are all the compliance features available on all license plans? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's uh, similar to the previous question. Uh, no, unfortunately not. Um, well, it's unfortunately not. Uh, ma majority of the of the key compliance features are available on the on the um, enterprise plans, so um, E3 and E5. Um, as you go down, if you, as you go down the stack, they, they don't. You're definitely not not getting the the, the cheap burger. You're still getting quite a meaty burger. Um, there might be a couple of things not there, but most of the core things you'll need, like um, some of the compliance tools, uh, multi-factor authentication, those are available right down to the business plans. Yeah. Beautiful. And the last question I think I can field, is this session being recorded? Yes, it is. And we will be sharing a copy of um, today's recording as well as answers to all the Q&A. But um, unless there's any other questions that pop through now, I think we can wrap it up. Uh, I do want to say thank you all for joining us today and especially thanks to our presenters, Troy and Omi. I know you both put a lot of work in today's session um, and it shows. So thank you very much. I'll send out an email uh, hopefully by the end of today with a recording of the session. Uh, if you do have any questions or immediate needs, please feel free to reach out to any of the presenters today via the QR code on your screen. We'll also be running the second part of this presentation in uh, two weeks time where we'll be covering identity and endpoint management. Uh, so we hope uh, and look forward to seeing you uh, for that session as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for joining.